Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house. A special welcome to any guests that are with us today. Certainly we're glad that you have joined us. Today we want to focus our attention on the right kind of boasting that we should be doing in our lives. And we'll do that by taking a look at the words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. May God bless your worship. We join now in singing hymn number 532. Please stand. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, Gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, look with mercy on our weaknesses and in all our dangers and needs. Stretch out the right hand of your majesty to help and defend us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Our Old Testament reading for today is taken from the prophet Jer or Zephaniah, chapter 2 and 3. Here the prophet beseeches the people to watch out for those who are arrogant and to seek humility in their lives. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. On that day you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and the humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join in singing Psalm 1. Our epistle reading for today is taken from the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian congregation from chapter 1. These words will serve as the basis for our sermon in just a few moments. 
Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. The gospel for this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus preaches here a portion of the Sermon on the Mount known as the Beatitudes. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for him 563.
mercy and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God's word for our focus this morning is our epistle reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus, don't you forget where you came from. Sometimes a family member or a good friend of another individual will say that to them when they begin to maybe do and achieve great things in life, when they're really climbing up the corporate ladder or becoming socially or financially very successful, maybe they become a little bit proud and their friend will say to them, don't forget where you came from. Loretta Lynn, one of the most famous or iconic country singers that ever lived, and yet she never really forgot where she came from, in one of her songs, probably her most famous song, The Coal Miner's Daughter, she sings about her humble upbringings as one of eight impoverished children where the only source of income in the family was, of course, the salary of her coal miner father. She never forgot that. Another singer who has sold more albums than the group U2 sings about his uh, very humble upbringings in, in eastern Tennessee, where he grew up going to church every Sunday and eating fried chicken and playing football each week as well, and how important it was to him to keep on calling his family, his mom and dad, every week. He even sings a song called Back Where I Come From. Some people would argue that in order to remain humble and level-headed through the ups and downs of life, the great achievements of life and the difficulties of life, you have to remember your roots. You have to remember where you came from, your origins, your foundation. And in a way, that's really what the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthian congregation today as well. He's telling them, remember where you came from. Now they were an important group of Christians, beloved by God exalted by God, forgiven by God, but they were not to forget where it is that they came from. Because when they remembered what God had called them out of and what God had called them to, then they would find their only source of real boasting in life. And that boasting was found only in Christ. Now, if you recall, and we've studied 1 Corinthians many times through the years, and 1 Corinthians is basically a very long, scathing letter that the Apostle Paul rebukes the Corinthian Christians for just about every kind of immorality and sin and vice that, they, that a Christian could possibly have. You have to remember that these Christians in Corinth were, at least during the time of 1 Corinthians, were fresh out of pagan idolatry there in Corinth. And they were still dealing with a lot of the same old problems, a lot of the same old sins that they had in their lives before they even knew Christ. And so chapter by chapter after chapter, Paul goes through and he begins to say, now that's not the way you're supposed to be thinking or acting. And you might even remember some of those vices that he had to deal with. He rebuked them because of their jealousy and their disunity, that some of them were actually thinking in their congregation that they were more important than others and therefore were being kind of haughty and looking down on others because other people in the church were not as important as they were. And then there was the other big problem of loyalties to certain Christian teachers or certain Christian preachers. Well, they would say, well, I'm loyal to this teacher or I'm loyal to that preacher because I think they're better or they're more edifying than this other one. And when Paul looked at some of those things, that foolishness, he said, that's exactly what it is. It is all just foolishness. You shouldn't be thinking like this at all. You should all be unified as one. After all, as he tells them, they pretty much came all from the same place. And they were all going to the same place in glory. So they might as well live together in unity right now. Because they had unity that was found in the Lord. They didn't need to focus on those little things that separated them. They needed to focus on the things that brought them together and unified them. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does today in our reading. He says that you were not extraordinary people on your own. But now, because of Christ, you are extraordinary people because God has called you to do extraordinary things and to shine with the light of Jesus Christ in that dark, pagan city of Corinth. But at the same time that they were great, that they were important, he says, don't forget where you came from. Today in our text, 
Paul reminds the Christians in Corinth, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Okay, maybe some of them were, but by and large, most of them were not doctors and lawyers and such. They were not the intellectual people of the day. They were not the, the philosophers of the day. They were just ordinary average people like you and me, finance workers, salesmen, office workers, service workers, whatever we might be here at Zion. That's the kind of people that in general they were as well. And it is in Christ and in Christ alone that they found this inseparable, unbreakable bond of love that united them in their relationships and in everything that they did. And that's what they needed to think about. That's what they needed to focus on. That was their source of unity, where they came from and where God brought them. What about you? If you would look at your history, your upbringing, what would you say about your own upbringing, your own foundations? Where do you come from? Where are your roots? I'll tell you a little bit about mine. Early on in my parents' marriage, uh, I was born to a welder and a farmer's daughter. And when my parents first got married, uh, they lived in rural Iowa. And they were actually dependent upon food stamps to feed my older brother and sister. Later on, they, of course, moved to Mequon here in Wisconsin. And at the age of nine, I began my life working on a tractor, working on a farm, and did farming for many, many years, along with a whole lot of other menial jobs along the way just to kind of get by until finally it was time to be done with school. And when my family got a new TV growing up, we just took that new TV and we put it on top of the old one. That one pretty much served as the stand for that new TV. We ate plenty of Spam sandwiches growing up, and sometimes my father would turn to me and he would say, Aaron, we're going to have to eat bark soon. And my friends down the road that we were close with, they had cable television. Well, we certainly didn't have cable television. And they had all the latest toys and spaceships from the Star Wars trilogy. And all I had was a C-3PO action figure and a laser gun. But I thought I was doing pretty good. And all that worldly wealth and all those things we know, they're just that. They're relative. And in the end, they don't really matter, do they? Again, you could probably all tell me about your upbringing as well. And I would guess that for every one of you, just like me, was more or less somewhere in the middle, somewhere just kind of an average, normal upbringing. I don't know of anybody here in this church this morning that grew up in a mansion. I don't know of anybody here whose mom or dad had incredible political or financial influence or power over other people. We're just ordinary, average people. And we would certainly not boast about who we are from the perspective of the world, because they would not be impressed by it. And we take to heart that the Apostle Paul was talking about us when he said, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. You see, God wants it to be completely clear that the great things that he has done and continues to do through each and every one of you is not really because of your greatness. But it's so often done, even though we lack that greatness in and, our, in and of ourselves. Remember what the Apostle Paul calls us in this world? And what he calls himself? When he looks at himself and his fellow believers and his fellow apostles, he says, you know what we are? As human beings, he says, we're jars of clay. Paul even calls himself and his fellow preachers just earthen vessels, breakable, fragile jars of clay. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes, but we have this treasure in jars of clay, and here's why it's just, we're just jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power, the power of God, the power of the gospel, is from him, and it is not from us. We too, first of all, remember who you are. We are just jars of clay. We are sinful, we are broken, we are fragile, we are imperfect, and at the same time that we're all those things, we have inside of our hearts the power of the gospel that never perishes and never fades away. That treasure is inside our jars of clay. You know, a lot of people in the world, maybe you even know some people like this, or maybe you're even tempted to do this sometime. 
They like to brag and they like to boast, right? They talk about maybe their level of education, how many classes they've taken, or maybe they talk about their achievements in life, or they talk about their possessions, or they might just be caught up in talking about their children and what their children have achieved. I would suggest today that sometimes we as Christians don't do enough boasting. But I'm not talking about boasting about our achievements. I'm not talking about boasting about our roots or our own personal background at all. Because that, the Apostle Paul, well, he calls that just a bunch of rubbish. But we know what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be doing the right kind of boasting. The boasting that we know has changed us, that has saved us. And the kind of boasting, the source of boasting that we know also has the ability to save other people as well. That seeks to bring no glory to us. Paul says, he says, therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, there's nothing wrong with boasting at all. As long as it's the right kind of boasting for the right reason and about the right person. We boast. Because the truth is, the reality is, we were not important. <laughs> but now we are very important. We ourselves were not influential. But now, because of God, we are influential. We are the most important influential people in the world with the message of the gospel, the love of Christ. And we were once lonely, but we are not lowly. God says you are exalted. He says this is what we are. It says it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. In our lives, we are to boast, but we are not to boast in ourselves. It is important for us to boast about what God has made us to be, but most importantly, it is important for us as lights of the gospel to be boasting about how God made us what we are now. In one of my favorite hymns, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, I always think of that boasting. We're in that song, we sing, this is the right kind of boasting. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have become my ransom. So may our boasting in life always be. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you always. Please stand as we now confess our Christian faith together with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the responsive prayer of the church. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all of your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. 
Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. <clears throat> Let your blessing rest on the planting, on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We also pray this week for our brother in Christ, Bill Rossa, who suffered a heart attack earlier this week. Dear Lord, we pray that you will, bring, you will be with him, that you will comfort him, and that now that he is at home, you will bring him to full healing as well. We entrust Bill into your care, O oh Lord. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. We now have an opportunity to worship with our offerings. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him, you made all things. In him, you are well pleased. He is the incarnate word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we glorify and honor you. O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he also took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our final hymn. It is a hymn that is new to us.